Hello everyone, I'm Alex and I'm here to talk about space. <laughs> yes, I'm an astronomer and uh, no, I'm not going to make any jokes about astrology tonight. Um, it says that in my horoscope, so that must be true. <laughs> so astronomers are people who like looking at the night sky and get angry whenever clouds show up. It's true. And as we pollute this world, the clouds are actually getting worse. We've been constantly told that there is no planet B. However, we astronomers see this as a bit of a challenge, and we have gone out in search of planet B, <laughs> beyond our own solar system. So what would this planet B actually look like? Well, it would look very much like Earth. All the essentials of life, breathable air, drinkable water, and fast Wi-Fi. <laughs> that last one is easy-ish, but to find water we need to look in this very narrow region known as a habitable zone. Too far away from the star, everything freezes, too close and everything boils. We have some experience of both those conditions here in Melbourne. <laughs> but in the habitable zone, everything is just right, something that continues to elude us here in Melbourne. <laughs> So how do we actually find a planet amongst all of these stars? Easier than you might think, planets are always trying to get our attention, whether or not they actually deserve it. <laughs> and this is, of course, photobombing. So we try to take a picture of something else, the planet just gets in the way. This literally happened to me a few years ago. I took this nice picture of the Milky Way galaxy, and it was only later I realised this smudge in the corner Planet Mars. <laughs> yeah, I discovered Mars. <laughs> and before you say anything, there's also a tree there on Earth. <laughs> but that's more my fault for not positioning the camera slightly to the left. <laughs> but the point is that thousands of planets have been discovered in the same method throughout our galaxy, beyond the solar system, people observe stars, the planet moves in front and it blocks out some of the light of that star. Unfortunately, most of the planets discovered through this method have been barren wastelands unsuitable for habitation. Sorry. <laughs> But there have been some more suitable planets discovered through another method, and this is using our old nemesis, Gravity, responsible for a lot of falls and injuries, and um, me nearly falling onto the stage just then. <laughs> but it's also responsible for keeping the planets on these nice orbits around the Sun. So how can something like this actually help us find planets? For this, we turn to Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And now, now this, of course, means if someone hits you, you should always hit them back. <laughs> it's just a law of physics. <laughs> and this is happening all the time on a cosmic scale. A sun exerts a gravitational force on a planet, and the planet exerts an equal and opposite force on the sun. So as the planet moves in one direction, the sun moves in the other direction. And we experts call this the wobble. <laughs> And it's only now that we're building telescopes powerful enough to see this wobble. And this is where I come in, on the Gaia Space Telescope. It's probably not your idea of what a telescope should look like. It actually looks like this. It's up in space, beyond any clouds or trees that might get in the way. It was launched 10 years ago by the European Space Agency. If you don't know who they are, it's like NASA, uh, but with more cheese, lederhosen and windmills. <laughs> I didn't even know how that's meant to work. <laughs> so why is this thing called Gaia? So here I'll let you in on a trade secret. All telescope names in astronomy basically fall into two categories. There's the basic boring or the confusing. And we're still yet to find the first clever telescope. Name. <laughs> so, so the first category, there are plenty of examples here on Earth. Um, we have the very large telescope, <laughs> the extremely large, <laughs> and the overwhelmingly large. <laughs> These are all real. And there seems to be an obsession with size, I don't know what that's about. 
But what about Gaia? So Gaia was the Greek goddess of the earth, the bringer of life. But that's not why the telescope is called Gaia. It's actually an acronym. Don't ask me what it stands for. No one remembers anymore. It's based on a telescope design that is no longer used. So this is an example of a confusing telescope. <laughs> but what Gaia actually does is it measures the accurate positions of a billion stars. Now this may seem like a lot, but it's actually only 1% of the galaxy. So to put that in perspective, imagine our country of Australia. You have a friend from, say, Europe who has no concept of distance. They're asking about sightseeing. And you ask, oh, how long are you over in Australia for? And they say, oh, just under a week, I'm going to visit Melbourne, Outback and everything, all in a single day. <laughs> and then you wonder how to break the news to them. But um, here at Gaia, we, um, we're not so naive. We know we have limited time and resources. So like this European visitor, we have to restrict ourselves in this short time to this circle around Melbourne, or the equivalent of that, which I'm sure has some interesting things to look at. <laughs> so I guess a billion stars will have to do. <laughs> but what does this actually look like? So throughout this talk, I've been showing some pretty pictures like this as a bit of a deception. This is what Gaia actually sees. <laughs> it's all about the numbers. So this may look like an Excel spreadsheet, and actually it is. <laughs> but it's very important. So every, every line here represents a star. It can tell me where the star is, how it's moving through space, and how bright it is. But I'm mainly interested in this one column, which is the error in all of these calculations. And this error is caused by that's right, the wobble. <laughs> so it's just one number for every star. It tells us something's going on, not exactly what's going on. A bit like if you wanted to know how your, Euro friend, your European friend is getting on in Melbourne, ask them how's your first day in Melbourne, they say something about a square and a sky thing, a bit vague, um, but with a bit of know-how, we fill in the gaps. <laughs> and, and that's what I'm doing with this column here. So most of the numbers you can see there um, are ones and zeros, there's 0 0.8, 1.1. Most of these are boring. But hidden away, there's actually a 3.07 there and a 4.97. These numbers are very exciting. <laughs> Trust me on that. <laughs> but you may be wondering, what do these numbers actually tell us? So to ordinary astronomers, if they see errors like that in Gaia's data, it tells them the observation is fucked. <laughs> but I see beyond that, and it can tell me that there might be a planet orbiting this star. And also, it can tell me how much the planet weighs. So I can literally weigh it against its star. And if we know the size of the wobble, it can also tell me how long the planet takes to orbit the star. And from this, we can tell where the planet is and whether or not it's in the habitable zone. And from this, we can then answer that age old question, the question everyone asks every day, how is the weather? <laughs> so it turns out predicting the weather on these planets is almost as difficult as predicting it here in Melbourne. <laughs> And the reason for that is that most of the planets we can actually see with Gaia are big. So think Jupiter, but even bigger. And that means they have no surface. And no surface means nowhere to put the water if there is any water, there are no rivers, no oceans. It's just clouds, endless clouds. So yeah, that makes astronomers quite angry, as you can imagine. <laughs> But, um, but it's not all bad news, um, because as scientists we can speculate. We know that Jupiter and Saturn have a lot of moons, and we can assume that these planets also have moons. So the noted explorer slash filmmaker James Cameron <laughs> has given us Pandora, which is a jungle moon orbiting a gas giant, and we know that that's just full of life. <laughs> so there is a precedent for this. <laughs> So if Gaia can actually detect something like this, it may actually finally live up to its name and become the bringer of life. 
and we may have then found the first clever telescope name. <laughs> but the big question is, will any of this work? So, I don't know, off the top of my head. So I turned again to astrology. <laughs> and today's horoscope, very optimistic, says that we will discover planet B, and it, will, and it will be a new home for humanity. That's quite good. But, like a good scientist, I looked at other sources, and found another one. It says we will finally discover that there is no planet B, but it's not all bad news, this will inspire real action on climate change. Then I went down a rabbit hole and found that Mercury is in retrograde. <laughs> Whatever that means. And, and this indicates that the current research will change absolutely nothing. <laughs> kind of bleak there. But I guarantee you, one of these horoscopes will come true. <laughs> and may one day be used as evidence that astrology is real after all. <laughs> so on that bombshell, I think I'll end it there. Thank you.